Thank you very much, Sri Niyotia, for that very kind introduction. Thank you also to many colleagues on the dais for their uh, welcoming words. Uh, uh, Srimati Rekha Sethi, uh, Sri Mohan Das Pai, uh, Sri Sanjeev Mehta, Sri Harshwadhan Niyotia, Sri Sanjay Kiloskar. Also, warm congratulations to the award winners today. Of course, uh, Sanjeev, uh, Sunil Munjal, Sri Baba Kalyani. Uh, a very good morning to other friends and colleagues in the audience, members of the media, and of course, to everyone else who's present here. It is indeed my fortune, my good uh, opportunity today to be able to talk to you about this thinking around farm to frontier. Now, I will apologize. Being a former management consultant, as uh, Sri Neotia was pointing out, I have to do a presentation and I have to do PowerPoint. So I apologize for that. And uh, let me just make sure the lapel mic is working here. Can you hear me? Is this working? Hello? Yeah, good, excellent. So being a former management consultant, as I said, uh, I have to do PowerPoint. But it is not going to be death by PowerPoint. I, I, I can assure you of that. Having gone uh, into public life, I recognize that whatever you say has to be short, it has to be pithy, it has to be engaging. So I will not do the consultant's PowerPoint, I'll do the politician's PowerPoint. <laughs> when I came into public life, uh, exactly as uh, Shri Niyotia was saying earlier, I had had a chance to work uh, both as a business person, as a management consultant, and as an investor. And of course, as a result of that, I had uh, seen many businesses, I had seen economic growth around the world. And so one of the things that really did exercise me, that one of the things that I really spent a lot of time thinking about in public service, was how should India grow? What should be India's development model? And Sanjeev was touching on that as well. And so when I spoke to my friends, when I spoke to my friends, economists, most of them, and I said, what's the development model that India should follow? And all of them said, it's farm to factory. India should follow the farm to factory model. You get people out of low productivity agriculture, you get them into factories, you urbanize, and you industrialize at the same time. That's the model everyone has followed. Whether it is the UK back at the time of the Industrial Revolution, whether it's the United States going through the Gilded Age and then into the Progressive Era, or more recently, whether it's Japan, it's Korea or China, everybody has followed the farm to factory model. There is no other model. This is the truth. This is what the economists and the policy thinkers told me. Now, and you will, you will appreciate this because like you, of course, uh, I'm a business person. The problem with economists is that they are economists. That's the problem with economists. Friends, they have never made payroll in their life. They have never lost money on a trade. They have never fired people. So when you hear their advice about how to grow businesses, how to grow the economy, you should be skeptical. Because most of what they say, most of what they say, and I say this as an engineer and a technologist as well, most of what they say is backward looking. They're looking at the rear view mirror. They're looking at China, they're looking at Korea, they're looking at the US and say, do what they did. And even now I get a lot of hostility from economists. Because they're saying, you know what, are you saying that India will have a model that's different from the rest of the world? And I have to say to them, yes, India is different. India needs its own unique development model because we have our own unique challenges. And the world has changed. How many factories are we going to build? How much water do we have? How much land do densely populated countries in the world? Did you know that? We have 2.5% of the world's land mass. We have 4% of the world's, world's fresh water. We have 17% of the world's population. We have 17% of the world's cattle. We are a very densely populated country with limited natural resources, we are facing real constraints when it comes to how much carbon we can put into the atmosphere as a responsible global citizen. How are we going to follow this backward-looking rear-view mirror farm to factory model? It doesn't compute, folks. It doesn't compute. So for the last few years, and one of the great things about this job is you get a chance to talk to everyone. 
So for the last few years, I've been asking every economist I could find, so tell me, what do we do? And I think that's the question that you all are also asking. It's fantastic, and I know if we run the math, and I can run the math as easily as anyone else in my head, if we run the math at 7 8% GDP growth, we get to 5 trillion and 10 trillion. That's easy. Anybody can run the math. The question is not the math. The question is not how do we get, how, how do, you know, whether we're going to get to 5 trillion or 10 trillion. The question is how. How do we do that in light of the natural resource constraints that we face, in light of the urbanization pressures that we face, in light of the education challenges that we face. In light of that, do we follow the farm to factory model? Can we really follow the farm to factory model? Or do we have something that's entirely different, that is sui generis, one of a kind, India's unique development model? Now my thesis, this is my own personal the thesis, it's not government policy, it's not. It's just a set of ideas I want to present to colleagues who think about technology, who think about disruption, who think about business, who think about how the economy grows and adds jobs. I want to present a set of ideas to you as colleagues and say, let's debate this. Let's ask ourselves these questions, not whether we'll get to five or 10 trillion, but let's ask ourselves how. How are we going to get to five or 10 trillion dollars? and have a better life, a more prosperous life, a higher quality of life for our citizens. What's India's unique development model? And friends, my thesis is it's not farm to factory. It's not farm to factory. And as a play on words, I'm saying it's not farm to factory, it's farm to frontier. We have to be at the frontier, whether it's the digital frontier, the technology frontier, the business frontier, or the productivity frontier. We have to be at the frontier, keep on disrupting, keep on innovating, keep on growing. That's the only way we can do it. Let's not be backward looking, let's be forward looking, farm to frontier. Now let's see if I can get the clicker to work. There we go. So if we think farm to frontier, let's make it human. Let's not be an economist and talk numbers and talk about uh, you know, different theories. Let's talk about a person. That's my voter. I have to talk about my voter. His name is Bhola Mehto. Bhola Mehto lives in Tati Jharia block in Hazaribag. How do I get Bhola Mehto a better job? Bhola Mehto does not want a job in the informal sector. You ask our Indians, you ask our young people, they're very aspirational, they're very ambitious. They don't want to work as a construction worker. They don't want to work in a dhaba as a waiter. They don't want an informal job. What they want, what our aspirational class, our young people, our bola methods want, is they want a formal sector job. And they either want a formal sector job, if they're from the north, if they're from Jharkhand or Bihar or UP, they want a job in government. They want a job in government. Or, this is a picture of an IAS officer. Or, they want a job if they are in the south, in a tech company, in an IT company, they want to work for the kinds of companies that Mohan funds and sit in a nice office in Bangalore in an air-conditioned chamber and enjoy life going to a pub in the evening. That's what they want. So the question for us, let's make it real, let's make it human. How do we give Bhola Mehto a job like one of these? That's what we have to do if we want to get to a trillion dollars and make sure our people are happy. That's the challenge in front of us. It's not an economic challenge. It's not a policy challenge. I believe at the heart of it, it's a human challenge. We have to meet the aspirations of these people. Now, let's also look at some numbers. If we look at some numbers and ask ourselves how many people we have in the workforce. So today, you know, and these are 2012 numbers, so we have to get them updated. Mohan tells me he has the most recent numbers. He's cranked them, he's got them all uh, refined, so I'm gonna use his numbers next time I do it. But basically, in 2012, when we did the last NSO, SSO survey, the total number of people in the workforce was 484 million people, of which, according to that survey, 2012 data, Mohan tells me these numbers have to be revised, the number of people in the informal sector is 409. About 90% or so, 80% or so, are in the informal sector. 15 million are in the formal government. If you define it more broadly, it's, more, it's closer to 25 million when you add armed forces, you add state and local government. But we have 20 to 25 million people who are in the formal sector in government. 
So Bhola Mehta, who wants that IAS job, he is not going to find a lot of those jobs because we have some government jobs, but we have limited government jobs, and those limited government jobs are going to grow as tax collections grow. So they are not going to leapfrog. It's not going to be an exponential growth. It's just going to grow slowly with GDP. So not too many government jobs. If we have to really give Bhola Mehta the job that he wants, we have to take people out of the informal sector where we have 400 million people and we have to bring them into the formal private sector, the 60 million where we have right now, that's the number we have to grow. We have to take people from the farm and into the private sector. That really is the way it has to happen. Now remember, even as we are doing this, this is 2012 numbers, even as we are doing it, we have a very young population and they're joining the workforce. That's the famous 10 to 12 million people joining the workforce every year. So even as we are moving people from the informal sector to the formal sector, the whole number of people itself is growing. So we have to keep playing catch up with respect to that. So that is also quite important. Now, here is a chart I want to spend a little bit of time on. I apologize, this is the one management consulting chart. It's got a lot of numbers and a lot of details on it. But it's actually an important chart. And it comes back to Bhola Mehto's dilemma. It comes back to Bhola Mehto's dilemma. The dilemma is that if we were to take Bhola Mehto from farming, which is where he is in Tati Jharia, in Hazaribagh district, his output right now in GDP, in per capita terms, is $1,600 is his output per capita for his family. There are about 240 million people who are employed in agriculture. Their total output is $386 billion. Therefore, their output per capita of the people who are working is $1,600. That is the output per capita of the people who are working in farming. If we take them into factories like textile factories, their output per capita, not GDP per capita, but their output per capita may go up a little bit. It may go up to $2,000. $2,500. If you bring them into auto in which Sri Kalyani's industry and other automotive industries, we do raise their output. Their output goes to $6,000. But if we really want to leapfrog, friends, if we really want to leapfrog, we have to get Bhola Mehto to be more productive. His output has to increase. Because unless your output increases, this is the central truth of every business. Which is if your workers are not producing more output, you can't pay them more. Am I right or wrong? If they are not producing more per capita, we can't pay them more. We can't give them the jobs that they want. The productivity of the worker is key to his income and his future. But if we get them a job, which is a factory job, where they are not paid very well, can we meet their aspirations for a middle class life? We cannot do that. Therefore, what we need to focus on as an economy, as business people, because it is going to come from the private sector, folks. The growth in jobs is going to have to come from the private sector, from the formalization of the economy. But if we just go the factory route, we are not going to be able to leapfrog, Sanjeev. And that is a very important point I want to make, which is that we really need to get to the frontier. Now, the good news is, that our economy has been creating high productivity jobs, high output jobs. If you look at what we've done in steel, you look at what we've done in IT services, aviation is a wonderful example where with about 200,000 people, we are generating $13 billion of output. And you take financial services again with 200,000 people, we are generating in the private sector, with our private sector banks, about $20 billion in output. So the output per person is high. And when the output per person is high, they earn more. That's the key to all of this, productivity. The productivity of our people. Bhola Mehto's productivity. He has to be able to produce more so he can earn more and lead a better life. Simple truth, but very difficult to implement. Now, how do we actually do that? Sorry, this chart has gotten a little spoiled. We were playing with it last night. I apologize. My, my PowerPoint skills obviously have deteriorated since I left consulting. <laughs> but essentially, the notion that we are trying to make in this chart is that we have to go not just from farm to factory, but actually to go to the productivity frontier. We have to go to the productivity frontier. Factory is not good enough. And if we want to go to the productivity frontier, <clears throat> we have to improve the skills of our individuals. 
our individuals have to be able to produce more through their own individual skills, but we also have to equip them. Every individual, Bhola Mehto, has to improve his skills while at the same time being embedded in a supply chain, being embedded in a business where he is equipped to produce more. So we have to work on two axes, the skills of our individuals as well as their participation in world-class, highly productive supply chains where they can actually do more. And that's what enables them to get to the productivity frontier. And let me just make another point. The point I want to make is that when we talk about GDP per capita, when we talk about becoming a middle income country, when we say that we have to take our GDP per capita and increase it from $1,800, which is where we are right now. We are a low income country with a GDP per capita of $1,800. When we say that we want to be a $8,000, $10,000 GDP per capita, people think of that as earnings. That's not earnings. GDP per capita is not what people earn. It's what people produce. So if we want to be a middle income country, by the way, China is already at $8,000. China is at $8,000. If we have to get to $8,000, $10,000 GDP per capita, friends, remember, Bhola Mehto has to produce $10,000, $15,000 of output. That's what he has to do. If we take him into textiles, he's going to produce $2,000 of output. Today, he's producing $1,600, $1,700 of output as a farmer. So we have to get Bhola Mehto, we've got to get our populations into these highly productive jobs. We have to get them to the frontier, the productivity frontier, where their output and their productivity increases. So how do we actually do that? Again, the chart is a little off. Apologies for this late night work. But I think the way we have to do it is that we first have to, if we want to do the leapfrog, we have to take Bhola Mehto and we have to equip him with the tools. Because fixing his skills, getting him a better education is a very long term thing. It takes time to build the cognitive skills. It takes time to improve the employability of people. It can be done. But people who are in the workforce who are 18, 20, 25, 30, we all know this because we've handled workforces. Once people are that age, their learning is not that fast. So we can't expect them to improve their skills overnight. That's not going to happen. Instead, what is going to happen is that if we plug them into a very productive supply chain, if we, product, if we plug them into a platform that equips them with the skills, then their output can increase. It does actually increase. So first we move them along the supply chain in terms of the kind of tools and resources they have in a market ecosystem. Once they are there, then the continuous innovation takes off. And as a result, we can enable as many Indians as possible to work in high output industries. Now, I'm talking like an economist. I'm talking in a very abstract way. Let me make it real for you. Think of somebody who works for a ride sharing company. Think of a driver who signs up for a ride sharing company. Now, before he worked for a ride-sharing company, how did he get dispatched? What was his business model? Which supply chain was he plugged into? What was his use of digital technology? There wasn't any of that. He hung around at the railway station waiting for a ride. He hung around at the airport waiting for a ride. He would spend hours waiting. Then he'd pick up a ride. He'd fumble around taking that person because he didn't know the way the person would say, let's go there. It's notoriously difficult to navigate in India because, you know, the maps are not very good, etc., etc. And eventually he would get to where he had to get to. The ride would take an hour when it could have taken half an hour because he didn't know the way very well. You'd be guiding him. You'd get frustrated. Navigation would be a problem. And then once you got there, you know, you'd be fighting with him about the change, the tip, all of this would be gone. That a ride-sharing company provides, what happens to dispatch? They are somewhere, they find out that there is a ride that's waiting for them around the corner, boom, they're there. Then that person tells them, go there, they look at a navigation map, Google Maps, whatever ways, look through it. And the one hour ride now takes them 20 or 30 minutes because they know exactly where they go to. And they don't even have to read if the ride is being told to them, the navigation is being told to them, you know, through these directions, turn by turn directions. And when they reach, their payment is automatic. 
what happens to the productivity of the driver when they're plugged into that technology platform? Their productivity goes up. What has changed in the skills of that individual? Nothing at first. They just learn how to use this platform very well. Their productivity has gone up. It's gone up 2x, 3x because of what they're doing. And over time, as they become more and more skilled in using the system, they, now they change from being just a person who's ferrying you around town to somebody who's actually even delivering things for you through the various different delivery models that are out there. So now suddenly their productivity goes up even more because they've innovated. That's the power of these technology platforms. Once we plug people into these kinds of technology platforms, their skills will automatically improve. And friends, we know this. We can use Mohan artificial intelligence. We can use machine learning to customize the skills we need to develop for a particular driver. He may be very good at navigation, not so good at payments. He may be very good at payments, not so good at dispatch. Once we build a custom profile on each individual, we can keep on over time improving their skills and make them a lot more productive. It's all about productivity. It's all about technology. Now, as I said, we have to plug them into a market ecosystem. What is a market ecosystem? Now, one of the challenges I found when I got into government is I say, folks, we've got to get markets to work well. And a lot of people look at me and say, markets, what are markets? What is a market ecosystem? Seriously. Now, we've got to get markets to work. If we don't unleash market forces, if we don't unleash innovation, if we don't unleash entrepreneurship, how are we going to create frontier industries? How are we going to create productivity-driven companies, innovative, disruptive companies? We've got to know what markets are. Now, I want to give you an example of drones, which is something I'm involved in right now. Friends, we are literally developing the market ecosystem for drones. And to develop the market ecosystem for drones, we have to think about many different elements. We have to think about market infrastructure. How do you define a market? What are the contracts? How do you resolve disputes? How do you regulate this market? We have to decide what do the products and the pricing mechanisms look like in this market. Because if we don't have symmetric information on that, the market doesn't clear. Buyers and sellers can't sell to each other. There's too much friction. Market is still born. How do we think about products and pricing? Where is the physical infrastructure that will support a drone ecosystem? Do we have the 4G network through which drones can navigate their way through the skies? Do we have billing and settlement systems through which drones can be paid for on a per-use basis for delivery and so on? Do we have that physical infrastructure to support that market ecosystem? And then we have to set the standards. We have to set the standards. Because if we don't set the standard, we balkanize and fragment the market, we don't develop the scale, and the market doesn't grow. Standard setting is key to market creation. And how do we set standards? Who gets involved in setting standards? That is so important. A lot of what this digital economy of the future is going to be like is who owns the standards? Who defines the standards? And if you look at it from the other side, from a businessman or an investor side, you say, I want standards to be owned privately. I want not de jure standards, but de facto standards. If I set the standard, I create the platform, I am the toll booth, and guess what? My market cap is a trillion dollars. That's what the power of the platform economy is. Who sets the standards. Who creates the market? Who is the architect? These are central questions for the economy of the future. If we want to be at the frontier, friends, we, as an economy, have to be able to set standards. We have to be able to create public platforms. This is a word of the future, public platforms. And I was very, very happy that the speakers before me, particularly Mohan, spoke a lot about platforms, public platforms. We have done something amazing, remarkable, historic in India. Please, if you take one thing away from this talk, one thing away, I want you to understand what we in India have done on public platforms. Mohan is prompting me, exactly correctly, to talk about the India stack. He is right. 
What we have done with the India stack, what we have done in payments through NPCI and UPI is unprecedented. What it is going to do to revolutionize this economy, make it more digital, make it more of a disruptive economy is incredible. But Mohan, you don't know the best yet. Because we have done it through the India stack, we now know how to do it again and again and again. And unlike in China, where many of the platforms are owned by private companies, and in many cases in the US also, where platforms are owned by private companies, they are not pri public platforms, they are private platforms. In India, we have seen them as public goods and created them as public platforms. We have done that with UPI. We have done that with the payment stack. We are doing that in health. And that's what Sri Suresh Prabhuji just said. What we have done in Ayushman Bharat through the National Health Agency and the health stack is extraordinary. We are of course covering 500 million people. But the whole process is going to be cashless and portable. You can, Bhola Mehto can, leave Tati Jharia, take his father who is suffering from cancer, go to Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai and his treatment is going to be covered cashless, portable, seamless. I said take one thing away and that is public platforms. We have created through the health stack the public platform to enable this kind of healthcare delivery. Now what is it going to pull from a supply side perspective in terms of technology innovation, in terms of a supply side response, in terms of hospitals, clinics, physicians, all kinds of services. That's how you build a public platform and build mass services on top of it. This is sui generis. This is, nobody else in the world is doing this, friends. This is the unique India development model. What we have done in payments, we are replicating in health right now. And let me add one more. And that is in travel. In travel. In travel, we are architecting a similar public platform called DigiYatra. In DigiYatra, we will do your KYC once. And once we have captured your KYC, and it's completely voluntary, you give us your biometrics. And right now, facial recognition is moving so quickly. Most likely, the underlying technology is going to be facial recognition. You just sign up. Mon, you are asking about flying today. We are going to make flying really, really easy for you. You sign up once. Bangalore Airport is already doing it, Mohan. So you can be the first person. If you want, we will make you the first person in Bangalore Airport. Done? Is that a done deal? Yeah, done. done. OK. So we'll get Mohan to sign up. So Mohan goes to Bangalore airport, he does his KYC, he goes to a kiosk, they capture his face, and we've got his biometrics in terms of facial recognition. And Mohan, after that, the line that you wanted, you said you don't want to have to deal with everybody else, you will have your own digital lane, Mohan. You will go through, your face will be your identification, you will go through the access to get into the airport, you will check in, you will have to go through security without a boarding pass, you will get onto the plane without a boarding pass, it's going to be all digital. That public platform, the digital standards have already been worked on for the last year and a half. We've had a working group working on putting together these digital standards. They've worked it out. And of course, we had the model of the India stack to build on. We've got help from iSpirit and the others, the people who've architected the India stack, and we've been working with them to do this. So it's a lightweight set, a lightweight set of technical specs, protocols, that are then available to everybody in the ecosystem to implement. So your PNR becomes active for four hours or so around your travel time. That PNR then becomes available one time, purged thereafter, so there's no privacy issue, to the airport. You go to the airport, your PNR is active, therefore you're allowed into the airport. That was the regulatory intervention that we said, if the airline or the travel agency has a PNR that is active, it's within four hours of travel, then it goes to the airport to allow you to get access. That was the only regulatory intervention required. Then the airport has your facial uh, biometrics, and then from there you can go right through board. The airport uses all of that information, and by the way, they are free to implement whatever technology, whichever vendor, however they want to do it. So we've allowed them to do that any which way they want, and that's what Bangalore, by the way, is implementing. They have already placed the order. So they go through and they implement it. Every airport implements the same protocol, and now suddenly, for the first time in the world, 
And Aita and Aikawa are studying this very closely. For the first time in the world, there is a national travel standard which can be implemented by any airport to allow you to travel digitally. Nowhere else in the world, friends, is this happening. As I said, one word, public platforms. Public platforms. That's how you actually build markets, by solving the standards problem, by creating these public platforms. So that's what we're doing with DigiYatra. We're doing a similar version of that in drones. I'm not going to get into the technical details, but just leave you with one thought, that if we're going to build a drone ecosystem in India, and we're going to be the leaders in the world as far as drones are concerned, friends, we will have thousands and thousands of drones in our skies in Bangalore, in Delhi, in Mumbai. How do we do traffic management when we have thousands of drones in the sky? It can only be done digitally. It can only be done through a public platform through standards which are interoperable and everybody has to follow. Again, we have to build these ecosystems. We have to build these public platforms so people can coordinate, people can collaborate, and we solve, and here I have to give it to the economists, we solve what is called in economics as the coordination problem. Solving the coordination problem is one of the singular tasks of the sovereign of a forward-looking sovereign that is thoughtful about how to get to trend trillion. We have to solve these massive coordination problems. Whether it's in electric vehicles, whether it is in drones, whether it is in healthcare, whether it is in payments, the role of the sovereign in building these markets, very importantly, is around setting these standards, creating these public platforms. So the market ecosystem, if we can plug people into these kinds of market ecosystems, we can really, really be able to do a lot for them. And of course, you know, the good news is that we have many highly productive companies that have been generated through this kind of innovation, through this kind of disruption. We've created hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap in, of course, IT services. We are seeing that uh, in many other industries, ride sharing. We're seeing that in financial services. We're seeing that in electric vehicles and on and on and on. So our economy has the ability to do this. We have shown it wave after wave of innovation from IT services to fintech to aviation to electric vehicles, renewable energy. In sector after sector, decade after decade, we have created such highly productive industries. We have done it. Now, this is what we need to reinforce. This is what we need to strengthen. This is what we need to encourage. And if we do that, and here is the central question that people always ask me when I talk farm to frontier. What the economist says, all right, so you say that India is going to have a unique development model? You think India is going to have a unique development model? How are you going to create the jobs? China has created the jobs. China has put people in factories. Can India create the jobs? Now, this is a thought experiment. This is not a projection, this is not a forecast. It's a thought experiment, and friends, it's a challenge to you. It's a challenge to you. It's a challenge to our business leaders, it's a challenge to our entrepreneurs. How do we create these frontier jobs? Mohan, that's the question. How do we innovate? How do we disrupt? Because we have to give Bhola Mehta a job. And the beauty of this, and Mohan and I have worked together very closely on this for a long time, when we look at these frontier jobs and we say, all right, fine, if today there are 10 million frontier jobs, we did a rough calculation, there are 4 million jobs in IT services alone, Mohan, 4 million in IT services. We say, all right, highly productive jobs, jobs where people are producing tens of thousands of dollars of output per capita, because that's where they get the income. That's how they can have middle class lives, that's how they can buy cars, that's how they can travel on planes. Those types of jobs, probably in the economy, are around 10 million in the private sector. Direct frontier jobs, I call them. But, and we've seen this through careful empirical analysis, for every direct frontier job, you actually do create three indirect jobs. So for every person working at HUL, Sanjeev, there's probably three other people that are supported by that person. Of course, Sanjeev is saying factor of 10. But I'm not sure how many of those 10, Sanjeev, are formal as opposed to informal. So these are formal, these are formal indirect jobs that are linked to direct frontier jobs. So it's a security guard who's on payroll, for instance. It's a bus driver that, who's on payroll, right? 
It's somebody working in the canteen who's on payroll. These are the kinds of formal indirect jobs that are related to one direct frontier job. Because the output per capita is high enough, it's seventy, eighty thousand dollars So they can support people who are in those formal indirect jobs. Now, that would mean that the total number of jobs that are linked to these frontier industries more. The industries at the productivity frontier, the, in the industries at the technology frontier is about 40 million today. And so the question is, can we over the next 20 years, if we have to get to $10 trillion, I believe, this is my personal view, my thesis, I believe we have to take the number of direct frontier jobs from 10 million to 50 million, which means we have to create 2 million of these jobs a year. That's what we, this is not economists are not going to do this, Sanjeev. Trust me. No economist is going to go out and put millions of people to work. But you are, Sanjeev. Sunil, you're going to do it. Harsh, you're going to do it. You all have to do this. We have to create these jobs in the businesses that we lead, in the businesses that we invest in. We have to create these jobs. And if we can create 2 million of these jobs a year over the next 20, 20 years, we will have gotten to 50 million. 50 million jobs that are in these highly productive industries and total frontier jobs, therefore, because of the direct-indirect ratio, will come to 200 million. So we will have 200 million families that are linked to frontier industries because of the jobs that we create. And that's what's going to power our economy forward. Because I'm not interested only in 10 trillion dollars. I'm not interested in 10 trillion dollars. What I want to know is, how do we keep growing? How do we keep innovating? How do we keep expanding opportunity for everyone? We have to go from 10 to 50 trillion, ultimately. But we can only do that if we have these companies, if we have the people who can keep innovating and creating new value and becoming more and more and more productive over time. And there, of course, as I said, public platforms, market creation, all these things become extremely important. That's what I believe. So that's what will get us to this 200 million jobs. Now, as I said, what is crucial to all of this is we have to create, we have to enable these markets to take off. And as we know, when markets take off, there is this typical S-shaped market development. And it's, it's crucial for us, which is what we're doing with drones right now, we're doing with electric vehicles right now, and so on. We have to jumpstart these frontier industries with a range of these things that really enable market ecosystems to happen. This is the conversation, friends, we need to have with you as business leaders. Are we enabling these markets to take off? Have we created the market ecosystem? This is the kind of conversation that policymakers need to have with business leaders. Because, as I said, it's all about highly productive jobs in the private sector. That's what's going to power this economy forward. There is no other magic. Highly productive, high output jobs in the private sector. That's the key to all of this, which means we've got to get these markets to take off. And if we do that, friends, if we do that, then we give Bhola Mehto a chance. If we have to give Bhola Mehto a frontier job, we have to either make him a dairy farmer so that he has 10 cows that he's keeping and he's milking them and he's part of a dairy supply chain, or alternatively, he's working in a dairy processing plant. So this is what we need to do for Bhola so he can go from farm to frontier. And while we are doing that, friends, remember, it's not just about Bhola Mehto. It's also about Gita Orao in Patratu. I've got to make sure that Gita Orao also can get a good job. And she also has to have a job that is forward-looking. Why not train her on a sewing robot? Why not get her into a really efficient textile factory, a really efficient with the most advanced equipment, because those are frontier industries as well. That's what we have to do. And so we end where we began. We end where we began, which is it's not about the $10 trillion economy. It's not about the $10 trillion economy. It's about making sure that Bhola Mehto and Gita around, Bhola Mehto and Gita around, are plugged into these world-class frontier businesses, these world-class frontier industries, so that their output keeps on increasing, keeps on getting better, so that they can lead more prosperous lives. And we have to do that wherever they may be, whether they are in rural areas, semi-urban areas, urban areas. 
We cannot expect all of them to come to the cities. We have to, to be a $10 trillion economy and beyond. And maybe in the rest of the conference, you should not just talk about $10 trillion. You have to talk about, have we put in place the drivers that will take us to $10 trillion and beyond? Because that is the sustainable growth. So if you have to go from $10 trillion and beyond, friends, my challenge to the economists, my challenge to the economists is, it's not farm to factory, it's farm to frontier. We have to keep growing, we have to keep innovating. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>